What's the difference between an internet flame war and a medieval poetic debate? One is a lengthy bout of abusive, childish bickering which devolves into mudslinging, character attacks, and bigotry. And the other happens on Twitter. Welcome to Liscapism. This is the penultimate video in my Medieval Curdle series. Up until now, these videos have paired a part of the process with a kind of learning or research that can help you with your costuming. This video is a little bit different. It is an addition to my Rose Garden series, where I explore the lives of notable women from history. Remember when I told you all about that seven months ago? No? Don't worry, there's a link in the description. Today, our notable lady is Christine de Pizan, one of Europe's first professional female authors, whose most famous work, The Book of the City of Ladies, is a masterful indictment of men's treatment of women in both life and literature, as well as a celebration of women throughout history. As I take you through the making of this medieval curdle, which I have been making with Christine in mind, I will tell you about her life, her works, and her legacy. Although Christine de Pizan has been on my list for a very long time, I would nonetheless like to thank Naomi for submitting Christine for consideration. It bolstered my confidence to write this video and to brave the wild world of medieval sewing. Thank you very much, Naomi. Part 1, in which it is explained the early life of Christine de Pizan. Christine was born in 1364 in Venice to a highly educated physician, Tommaso di Benvenuto de Pizzano, who was, at the time, court astrologer and trusted counsel to the Republic of Venice. Astrology at the time was significantly less concerned with predicting the future, and was based rather on a belief that the planets and stars exerted a physical effect on the world and people, which influenced, among other things, what kind of medical treatment would be best for them. He had been a scholar and professor at the prestigious University of Bologna, which was one of the chief recommendations in his favor when he was offered positions at both the royal courts of Hungary and France. He opted to serve Charles V of France out of a desire to have an opportunity to study at the University of Paris. Christine was four years old when she arrived in Paris. Due to her father's position, Christine had the singular experience of witnessing life at the royal court up close without being a member of the nobility. This first-hand experience informed a great deal of her writing, as well as her ability to gain patrons when she started her writing career. To explain some of the context of what Christine was living through, let's step back for a second to get a full scope of what was happening in late 14th century Europe. This is going to be a very quick summary of a lot of stuff, so if it seems general, that's because it is. This period in European history is perhaps best described by a number of events which are today collectively referred to as the crisis of the late Middle Ages. Literally, that is a thing. There was so much bad shit going on that historians at one point just said, let's just say it was bad, okay? Beginning in the early 14th century, a global cooling period known today as the Little Ice Age began to show its teeth. Its effect on Europe was widespread drought and famine, including the aptly named Great Famine, which resulted in mass starvation, price inflation, industry collapse, and disease which took another two centuries to fully recover from. The Hundred Years' War, which in itself encompasses 116 years of conflicts, truces, internal royal succession disputes, and international political maneuvering, was not even at its halfway point. The Papal Schism, which would see two different popes trying to lead the Catholic Church, was about 10 years away from its beginning. It would lead to a crisis in the Roman Church that would not be matched until 150 years later by the Protestant Reformation. So, yeah, there was some stuff going on. I don't generally like to engage in what is referred to as great man history, where influence is unduly credited to singular figures. However, the behavior and values of the King of France had a direct impact on the life of Christine de Pizan, so here's a brief explanation as to why. Charles V became King of France the same year that Christine was born, during a time of relative peace in Europe. In general, his reign is seen in a positive light, especially given the crises that bookended his time on the throne. However, none of that is as important for us as his ideas about the pursuit of knowledge. The king was, unusually for his time, highly academic and well-read. His hiring of Thomas de Pizan, as he was now styled, was one of the many ways that Charles V exemplified the high value he placed on learning in the sciences. This is no better expressed than in the Royal Librairie, where Charles had purchased and commissioned a collection of manuscripts, both religious and secular, that was one of the most massive collections to exist in Europe for centuries. Christine had direct knowledge of this collection and the floor above it, which was set up as a study room where visitors could come to read. As if this wasn't enough, Charles also commissioned translations of many of the Latin works, which would allow those not educated in the classical languages to read them as well. 
This is all to say that Christine was raised to value learning and knowledge not just in scholars and professionals, but in the sovereign and anyone else who wished to better understand the world. Although she did not begin writing herself until after the death of both Charles V and her father, both men left an indelible impact on her interest in education. When she was 15, her parents chose a husband for her, the court notary Etienne de Castel. He was about 25 at the time of his marriage and was soon after made a royal secretary, which was a lifetime appointment. Royal secretaries were an intellectual elite, and the lifetime position promised very good prospects for Christine's future. By her own account, the marriage was a very happy one. Based on Christine's writing style and existing manuscripts written in her own hand, it is strongly believed that, among other things, her husband encouraged her love of learning by teaching her the standard formatting and styles of court notaries and secretaries. In 1380, Charles V died, leaving the future of both her family as well as the country in a precarious position. Charles VI was only 11 years old, and while the former king had done his utmost to establish a regency structure that would assure stability, he underestimated the personal ambitions of his brothers, the dukes. Thomas de Pizan was luckily retained as a member of the royal household, but at a greatly reduced wage, which was not consistently paid. Then, her father passed away sometime after January 1387. Two years later, her husband Etienne died while away from home. At the age of 25, Christine was therefore widowed and suddenly responsible for the lives of her mother, her children, and her niece. Her already difficult situation was worsened by corrupt officials of the Royal Accounting Office who refused to pay her money she was owed from her husband's estate. At one time during this period, she was involved in four separate lawsuits in the Parisian courts, and then also fell ill for a period of time. In addition, around this time was when Charles VI began to suffer from bouts of delusion and psychosis, which would prevent him from governing effectively. From 1393 onwards, the Regency was re-established and thus began three decades of internal power struggles and eventual civil war. It was only at this point, around 1394, that Christine de Pizan began writing poetry. She explains in later works that this was a way for her to manage her overwhelming grief at the successive losses, both familial and financial, that she had endured, as well as providing an income. Christine established her writing publicly at the court of the Duke of Orléans. The Duke had married Valentina Visconti, another unusually literate woman from Italy. So it's no wonder that Christine felt that her poetry might be welcome there. And it was. Part two in which it is recounted how Christine de Pizan is a literary badass. Christine began writing in the standard tradition of ballades and other courtly styles of poetry, which were popular and well-received. Even in these highly structured and ritualized poetic traditions, Christine has been observed experimenting and tweaking the forms to reveal her own skills and perspectives. Many of her observations in these early poems exemplify an attention to nuance and the complexity of human life and emotions that is a major theme throughout her career. In 1401, Christine engaged in a literary debate, which was a turning point for her career during her lifetime and resulted in one of the more important works that she ever produced. So let's get some context for that. Around 1236, Guillaume de Lory wrote an allegorical poem called The Romance of the Rose, which describes in its original 4,000 lines, the art of romantic and courtly love. The poem comes to an abrupt end before the resolution of the narrative, and it is assumed therefore to be unfinished. About 40 years later, a man by the name of Jean de Meun continued the poem by adding 17,000 additional verses. If you're having trouble imagining what that is in real terms, I'll give you two comparisons. Beowulf is about 3,000 lines long. The whole of the Canterbury Tales is 17,000 lines. In terms of word count, this would look like if you took The Great Gatsby and added the whole of Emma. Not only did Jean de Meun add more than four times the original number of lines, he also significantly changed the tone, plot, style, and purpose of the work. His portion converts the work into a bitter, sarcastic social satire. This portion of the poem reads like an encyclopedia of complaint, discussing issues at tedious length. Chief among his gripes, and the most important for our author Christine, was the inherent licentiousness of women, among other innumerable faults and vices he chose to outline. After a conversation with fellow writer Jean de Montreuil, he and Christine exchanged a few letters in a polite and academic fashion in which they fundamentally disagreed about the merits of the work, especially as regards the treatment of women. Montreuil liked the poem, and Christine largely did not. It's worth noting at this moment that Christine had a prominent literary ally in Chancellor of Notre Dame de Paris, Jean Garçon. That should have been an end to it, except that Gontier Coll, a friend of Montreuil, 
and, from all that I can tell, a professional shit disturber, expressed an interest in corresponding with Christine on the same subject. Call's letters were arch and condescending in the extreme. Christine, after several frustrating exchanges, collected all the documents that she had from the whole debate thus far and sent a copy each to the Queen of France and the Provost of Paris, from whom she clearly hoped for literary and official support. This is actually something that was fairly standard at the time. It sounds a little bit insane, but I promise it was pretty normal. This again should have been the end, but Cole's brother Pierre, a canon of Notre Dame, decided to take her to task along with her most prominent ally Jean de Garçon. His letters are clearly designed to offend and insult both her and Garçon. He had, at this point, abandoned all pretense of literary debate. Sections of his letters speculate as to the sex life of Garçon, among other things. As Chancellor of Notre Dame, Garçon was effectively Pierre Cole's superior, so this seems like a really bad move. Garçon wrote a stern response in Latin, in which he not only lectures Cole on the inappropriateness of his letter, but also the fact that at several points he expresses ideas and opinion which came very close to what was considered heresy at the time. This promptly ended the debate. Permanently this time. It's worth saying that the majority of the literary debate didn't actually involve Christine or the Cole brothers, but Christine's involvement and the specific grievances she raised in regards to the treatment of women gained a lot of public attention at the time and is the portion of the debate that has lasted through history. During this time, she also wrote several more works and further established herself as a literary authority, not only in France, but also in England and Italy, where works of hers were already being copied and translated. With more maturity as an author and poet, she also wrote compelling allegorical verses exploring social and moral quandaries, while at the same time expressing her own life experiences. This kind of introspective writing was almost unprecedented in the medieval period and gives us real insights about the lives of women at this time which would otherwise have gone unrecorded. Due to the success of these works, the Duke of Burgundy commissioned Christine to write a biography of the late King Charles V, which demonstrates how much her work was recognized at the time for its merit and how much she was admired for her intelligence. The biography is by no means impartial, and it is often criticized for being a kind of panegyric, crammed full of nostalgia. But this criticism takes the work out of context. The purpose of this work was not to provide the world with an unbiased retelling of the life of the monarch, and indeed there wasn't any kind of precedent for that kind of biography anyways. It was intended to preserve the reputation of Charles V and lay it down for posterity. Christine's happy childhood memories, as well as a remembrance of a more peaceful time in France, was bound to color this already intentionally laudatory work. When this prestigious commission was completed, Christine embarked on a project of a much more personal nature which would become her most famous work. Part 3, in which Christine de Pizan's greatest work and legacy are described. Christine de Pizan completed the Book of the City of Ladies around 1405. It stands as a more formal, long-form response to the Romance of the Rose. It takes the form of an allegorical dream, in which Christine describes herself being visited by three virtues, Lady Reason, Lady Rectitude, and Lady Justice. In a somewhat repetitive format, Christine asks questions about why men think so ill of women and believe them to be lazy, evil, prone to infidelity, unworthy of education, etc. With each question, the virtues dispute the claims and provide numerous examples to the contrary from history, scripture, and classical mythology. As the virtues educate Christine, they task her with building a city in which the great women of the past and future will reside. In total, Christine outlines the lives, histories, exploits, and virtues of over 165 specific women from history, mythology, biblical stories, and more contemporary times. In doing this, Christine is not only recounting other works that she would have had for reference, but demonstrating her own thorough knowledge and synthesis of these stories. She puts individual characterizations, motivations, and contemporary readings on these stories and effectively uses them to support her arguments. Being a book from the beginning of the 15th century, it has obviously not aged well in all respects. But Christine's examples of misogyny and the negative treatment of women are hauntingly familiar to debates and discussions that continue today. Topics of consent, respectability politics, personal agency, domestic roles, and the double standard placed on women's virtue are among the many topics that Christine touches upon which continue to be relevant today. Christine continued to write for another decade, seeking patronage where she could in the midst of a civil war in addition to continuing war with the English. She was living with her son and his wife during this time, and as there is no record of her writing again until 1418, it can be supposed that she spent at least some of this time helping to raise her three grandchildren. 
She was forced to flee Paris with her daughter-in-law and grandchildren when Burgundian forces violently invaded the city. Despite having been patronized over the years by two different dukes of Burgundy, her son was a royal secretary and it would be assumed that her allegiances lay in that quarter. These years were understandably hard for Christine and for the people of France. The English, taking advantage of internal struggles, had gained a decisive advantage over the French. Events like the Battle of Agincourt represented not only military losses, but overwhelming loss of life. It was in the aftermath of these events that Christine wrote some of her most depressing and despairing works, including The Letter Concerning the Prison of Human Life, which is as depressing to read as it sounds. A few years later, her son passed away, and her daughter-in-law was subjected to similar social and financial struggles that Christine had endured 20 years before. It was during this time that it is believed Christine moved to the Abbey in Poissy, where her daughter had moved with Princess Marie in the 1390s. Christine lived the rest of her life in the Abbey. As if fate wished to comfort Christine in her twilight years after so many years of struggle and despair, news reached her of Jeanne d'Arc. Jeanne, known in English as Joan of Arc, led the French army in a series of victories over the English in the summer of 1429. Inspired by this woman, who must have embodied all of Christine's hopes for the progress of women and of France, put pen to paper one last time to write the tale of Joan of Arc. It was the first poem to be written about the military heroine, and the only one to be written during her short lifetime. It is believed that Christine died at Poissy sometime around 1430 at the age of 65 or 66. Almost every account I have read of her life expresses a sincere wish that she did not live long enough to hear about Joan's capture in the spring of 1430 which resulted in her trial and execution in 1431. I must say that I agree. I hope with all my heart that Christine passed on from this world with at least this shred of hope intact. Christine's works remained popular, especially the Book of the City of Ladies, and its follow-up The Three Virtues. These books were copied, translated, and widely read for over a century after her death. She fell out of common knowledge, along with most of her literary contemporaries, in favor of the Renaissance craze for classical literature. Interest in her works was revived in around the 19th century with the renewed interest in medieval literature, and she is now widely recognized for her talent and influence on the literary canon. I tried for a while to shoehorn Christine's story into some kind of tortured metaphor on how to research historical costuming to keep up with the theme of this series. But when I really thought about it, I realized that telling Christine's story was all that I wanted to do. No one ever justifies their choice to cosplay a favorite character or to remake a favorite extant garment, and so maybe I don't have to do that with Christine. Maybe after four videos where I extol the benefits of research and learning, I can just let this gown exist for its own sake, inspired by one of my literary heroes. Thanks to everyone who responded so kindly to my not releasing a video last week. After releasing videos weekly since September, which I am extremely proud of, I've decided that I don't really like that workflow. I may thrive with structure, but this turnaround time is forcing me to make compromises that I don't care for. As of this week, I'll be moving to a bi-weekly release schedule. If that works, I'll stick to it. If not, I'll try something else. Since this is cutting my output in half, I suspect I will experience a similar reduction in my YouTube ad revenue. I would ask, therefore, if it is in your power to offer your support via Patreon or Ko-fi donation to please consider it. And speaking of Patreon, I owe Sabina and Isabella, as well as D'Artagnan and Flynn, a huge thank you for becoming patrons at the Mary Shelley tier. I am so humbled and grateful, and thank you very much to each of you. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, don't forget to subscribe. If you know somebody who appreciates badass women from history, why not share this video with them? Have a great week, and I'll see you soon!